when I watch my little son talk to my iPhone, Siri easily passes his Turing test. And Siri writes down everything he says. So it's obvious he's never going to get the practice in handwriting like we did. Handwriting is just as a skill going down the drain. Is that sad? Don't get me wrong, I love handwritings, but all our handwritings are historic already, right now. If the Bible says, make way for the new, what will that be? Isn't that the ultimately more interesting question? All of us, every day, we create an enormous big data footprint. By booking, shopping, uh, banking, mailing, um, socialing, you name it. Big data is influencing every aspect, almost every aspect of our life. That's why we call it a data-driven society. And we created that. First, we shape our tools, and then our tools they shape us. So, what will big data do to us? How will it shape us? What will we have to learn? Which skills do we have to achieve to stay on top of that? And what are we going to teach our children? I like citizen data science for that. Empowering everyday people, you and me, learning how to understand and act on data. And it's not going to be much about handwriting or even language, not even so much about numbers or mathematics, but much more about complex images like this map, where we can use ancient capacities, uh, ancient skills to learn from images. How did all of this begin? It began with Galileo Galilei and his peers, when he said, measure what's measurable, and make measurable what's not so. He never said the last part. He was a narcissistic trick, I give you that, rightfully convicted, but he was not silly. How would you measure something that cannot be measured anyway? Famous Austrian economist and former finance minister and Stanford professor Joseph Schumpeter did not really get that. He thought his beloved economics could become a real science by using scientific, magic, uh, scientific methods, magically transforming it to a real science. Since astrology still provides better prediction than economics, this did not really work out. Don't you agree? He invented business metrics, or what we now call key performance indicators, to measure the unmeasurable, like GDP, earnings before interest and taxes, uh, credit ratings, word university ranking, Facebook fans, body mask index. Business professors, economics professors, they like all these business metrics, except one, the world university ranking. If their own university is ranked bad, they easily can explain to you, well, everything of this is just a sham. That's why we call these metrics vanity metrics. As a scientist of stature, I created my own metric. I call it the hitchhiker's metric of everything. Take every existing metric, divide it by counter, and sum it up. What's going to be the result? Anyone? 42. Ah, thank you. Yes, 42. And yes, it's completely useless, but it's a business metric. What else would you expect? There's a saying in my country, Austria, which says, if something does not help, at least it does not hurt anything. Is this true for business metrics? Let's take the subprime crisis. Take mortgages, bundle them, wrap a metric around them, let's say a credit rating. Bundle them again, put a metric around them again, and repeat this as often as you like. And then finally, believe in that. Then you get a world economic crisis. The numbers themselves are innocent. It's us who believe they have something to do with facts. That I call Schumpeter's Church of Econometrics. Schumpeter's contemporary, Mark Twain, 
already knew there were lies, damned lies and statistics. An example. Let's take all the finance information of your company and all the business information or of your state or your entity. Maybe it's about 50 gigabytes of data. And then you do your calculation and arrive, let's say, at an uh, earnings, for example. And this number takes up maybe 50 bytes of data. So where did all the relevant information go to? Some people really believe the information still is in this little number. But for them, I have a bad information, that's not really possible. Or as Mariah Mayer at another TED talk put it, perfectly statistics are stripping away all the riches of the original data. So for her, it's not so much about um, being the worst of lies, much more just about the embezzlement of relevant informations. And if I talk to data scientists, data specialists, and I ask them, why don't you do something real, something useful with your data? Act on your data. Actionability, that's the uh, that's when information really can be acted on, when you can actually do something with your data. You can't do this based on statistics because of their mathematical properties, you can't turn them around. If you need to do something, maybe you need to increase a specific salary, fire another person, order specific new products, or reroute the trade line, or whatever you do, you only can these, uh, do this on a data level. The same as an air traffic control officer, give him two metrics, like 200 planes in your airspace and uh, let's say 500 miles per hour medium velocity of the planes. This would be catastrophic, all planes would crash. He needs to see every plane with every direction, remaining flight time, velocity, height and everything else on a very big screen. And then if he has to land the plane you are sitting in, something wonderful happens. He already got a mental model of his data in his brain. He does not even need to look at the screen anymore. He intuitively does the right decisions. These so-called mental models, they are very small, individual functional models. It's a psychological concept. They help you to understand technical and physical and social processes and other complex situations. It's like you driving your car when you know when uh, to change the gear, how uh, to steer your wheel, uh, how the other cars are um, acting. So it provides you predictions and explanations of complex interactions. These are doctors in a Swiss hospital preparing for an operation, mentally walking through it. Doctors like these would never trust on numbers. I have to say a pulse is a very important number, but if you need to operate, you really need to look inside, and that's an ultrasound of a heart valve. This helps you to build a correct mental model if you're a surgeon, and you want them to have a correct mental model if they operate on you. This data visualization has nothing to do with the reality. It's just the physical, the reflections of sound waves uh, the reflections on the tissue. That's the data visualization of that. And they do it intuitively. So intuition is about the recognition of familiar patterns followed by appropriate actions. It has nothing to do with voodoo. That's why an experienced fireman leaves a building just before it crashes down behind him usually carrying a rookie on his neck out uh, of this burning building because he did not realize the patterns the experienced fireman already knew. We here are talking about big data and not so much about firemen and as Susan Ettlinger put it perfect, big data enables bad decisions just more quickly, efficiently and with far greater impact. So how to stay on top of that? How could we manage that? We live in this world. I propose visual metaphors, like, um, let's say, planetary systems with gravitational forces at work. What? Okay, let me give you an example. What's that? 
Anyone? Yes, Lord of the Rings. Which part? Anyone? Yes, it's part three. So then it or down there might be a hint. That's the data visualization of a movie script, 200 pages. And if someone talks a lot, uh, like Gandalf, he is big. And if he talks a lot to Aragorn, they travel together, they are close. The same with Sam and Frodo on the top, they talk to Gollum and Smeagol as well. So 200 pages of movie script just in one image to let you understand it. Another visual metaphor, sound waves. What if you could hear people talk on Facebook? All the likes, the shares, the comments, and everything else. How would the sound wave visualization look like? That's the sound wave of the Brexit. So what you see on top is UK Independence Party. On the right, you see uh, the final voting. And down there, you see David Cameron resigning. Images have a great value if they force you to see something you never expected. And that's the power of explorative data analysis. It's not so much about the right answers, it's about the right questions first and then the right answers later. So are you ready for that? Are your skills honed? Let's do a test. Are you a visual thinker? Who is, remembers faces more easy than names? Yes, about 60%. Who is good in packing his car or his suitcase, but still has a messy desk? Yes. So Albert Einstein said, if a messy desk points to a messy mind, uh, to what points an empty desk? <laughs> and finally, good orientation. If you park your car in a new city, who finds it rather easily, but usually is not punctually, on time. So, you are visual thinkers. You easily can interpret such pictures, and the primary organ for this, of course, is the eye. It provides 90% of the overall sensory input. It takes its much faster understanding an image than some reading some text, and about 50% of our brain power goes into visual processing. But there's a drawback. Who sees the dolphins? Dolphins, anyone? <laughs> dolphins, yes, yes. So, who sees the dolphins now? Okay, sometimes people see things which are not there. Sometimes children would only see uh, dolphins, of course. So, in this case, it's not a big problem for you. It's uh, more like it means you have a healthy sex life. Okay, some of you saw the dolphins. I'm, I'm very sorry <laughs> about that. So, for you to take away from my talk, three ways to go. First, you may trust in the law. Uh, maybe we will get lawmakers someday who get the point. And maybe after that, NSA will someday and their peers will comply to the law. I don't know so much about that, but maybe it happens. Or you may uh, trust in the machine, like Google does. They're building a supercomputer not far away from here at Zurich. They're hiring all available machine learning experts there. I have to say, I don't fear the rise of the evil supercomputer, because there will be good Terminators too, from Austria. <laughs> now number three. Why don't you trust in yourself? Learn the skills you need, control your data, and if our society is driven by data, get back into the driver's seat. So you learn, you decide, and you act on your data. Before I show you my last metaphor, which is about a map, showing Twitter conversations from Walter Raffelsberger, who did these amazing visualizations. I want to remind you, we have these amazing ancient capabilities of pattern recognition and intuition. So for me, there is no sign that humanity will suffer in the coming data ages. On the contrary, I think 
we are at the beginning of an amazing journey, putting humanity in the center again. And I really hope, I really hope you'll join. Thank you.